good afternoon if you're watching online. Good afternoon to all our people that are here in the audience. It is great to have you here today. My name is Jason Hermitage and I am the VP for our Global Partner Solutions Group and responsible for the Accenture Avanade relationship. Couldn't be more excited to have you here and putting your energy and investing your time to really understand the world of AI and what's coming. Uh, it's been a fantastic couple of days where we've been able to learn and share and I hope today is gonna be another great day for you. Um, I'm going to start with, you know, one of the questions that we get a lot at Microsoft is, you know, how should we really think about AI? There's so much news, there's so much hype. Really, how do I make it practical for my organization to be able to take advantage of these tools and abilities to be improve my organization? And, you know, really, I think one of the things you're going to get of today's session is really how to do that, how to make it really practical for your organization. And the way that I think about it is really there's sort of three parts to it. One is how do you take advantage of the AI that we've invested billions of dollars to be able to go take, to take advantage of that today. And you heard from Satya and other leaders across the company about how you can do that with M365 and GitHub. The second thing is how do you take and leverage the R&D that's been done by our industry partners into their applications? And how does that change your industry, whether financial services, retail, or manufacturing? And the third is really about how you leverage your data with AI to create the competitive advantage for your organization. And that, again, is an exciting way for us to really think differently about what our companies do and how we bring services to market and service our customers. And so again, this is a very short, medium, long-term strategy that I think every organization can think about what that means for them. But I'm really excited today because we have some customers, some industry experts to really talk about what they've learned on this journey for adopting generative AI and how they have thought about this in their organization. And so I'm really excited to welcome on stage Aaron Reich, who's gonna be our facilitator and guide us through this conversation. Please join me in welcoming Aaron. Hey everyone, we're gonna have a super exciting conversation today, um, really trying to cut through the hype of everything that's going on from AI and generative AI. Before I invite our panel up there though, I wanna cover three things as a backdrop to the discussion that we're gonna have. So the first is how to actually think because of the pace of change and for anyone that in here, sat through the sessions for the last two days, there is an enormous amount of change that is going on and the pace of technology specifically related to AI. So from an organization perspective, how do you think about the readiness and the different domains that you need to think about as a part of this, going from the risk mitigation to the massive thing that's gotta happen from a people change perspective, all the way to even what we're trying to do today is around fluency. And how do we just keep at pace of what's actually happening? The second is we are not in another realm of digital transformation or whatever transformation that you want to call it. As we look at what's happening from an AI perspective and specifically with Gen AI, you're already on a transformation journey. And while you're on that journey, now there's these new set of technology and how do you actually apply it? And so how do you think about where you're gonna optimize things within your business today? And then how are you actually in some of the planning taking a step back and going, ooh, we have this new technology now. How do I actually reimagine some of the things that I've got to be able to do within my business? And then the third thing, and this is what we're gonna spend the majority of the time in our panel discussion on today, is thinking about the foundation. What are the building blocks that you need to put in place today? What are those use cases? How are you driving and delivering the value as a part of the impact that you're trying to drive in the business? So with that, I want us to get right into our panel discussion. Um, and first up, I wanna invite Florin Rotar. He is Avanade's Chief AI Officer. Florin. Next up, I wanna introduce uh, Rich Holzman. He's a Senior Managing Director at Accenture, focused on data and AI and the go-to-market. Hey, Rich. All right, next I wanna invite uh, Mike Wiederman. He is from Dow and is focused as their Senior Director on Employee Experiences and Services. And last but not least, I wanna invite Carlos Cantaniere from Vale, who is a Cloud and Data Architect. 
So thank you all for being here. So where I want to start is, um, Mike, I want to talk first with you a little bit about <coughs> the first day of the keynotes, mm -hmm. right? We heard Copilot throughout the whole thing. Yep. Dow has been on a journey with Copilot. Can you share a little bit of what you all are doing and how you're thinking about it and applying it? Yeah, so I'll hit predominantly on M365 Copilot. We've been on a journey for about five and a half months or so. We started with the Compass Preview Program, um, five users out of 36,000 employees. We moved to 10 users, and then now we're at 300, and, and we plan to scale to about 20,000, so about 60 to 65% of the company. I haven't done the math, but... Um, uh, the, the journey has been, has been interesting, and it's definitely been a, a maturity journey. I would say when we started, um, you know, you could only use the, the web-based apps uh, and the capabilities. Then we moved to desktop apps. Um, most of our users started with summarizing uh, Teams meetings and creating action items. Um, and then they moved to affinitizing some of those notes and, and you know, making great insights out of them, and then generating content. So the, I think the the maturity of our organization has grown with the, the maturity of the of the capabilities, and then yesterday just blew my mind on what the next step is overall. Um, and then what we've been looking at for for a few months is um, really the the extensibility of Copilot and how do we take it to the next level. Um, the first part we're going to start with that we've been working on for about four weeks now uh, with Microsoft is extending Copilot to um, to ServiceNow to completely transform our IT support. And so if you think about today when you're, you know, your computer's not running right or need to be added to a distribution list or even something simple like that or ordering a new workstation, um, people have to go to an intranet site. They have to get into service now. They have to know where to go. Uh, but what if in 365 chat you could just type order me a computer and it would ask you the four fields that you have to fill in to get one. What yep. model do you want? How much memory? Um, and, and go from there. So we're exploring that right now. So the plan is to transform IT services and support first, and then probably move on to HR, because they have the other most tickets and support calls um, in the company. So that's where we're at. We didn't know about Copilot um, Studio until yesterday, mm -hmm. and so now it's like, okay, we might be able to go faster uh, and just yeah. totally transform that. So right. we're pretty I, excited. I want to come back to Copilot Studio um, in a moment. Yeah. Uh, Florin, I'm Curious from, from you, I know that for <coughs> what feels like probably the past couple of months, you've been having lots of different conversations with sort of the C-suite and boards at lots of different organizations around the globe, um, reflecting on what you've seen and kind of heard at Ignite here, you know, the things that you heard from what Micah shared, kind of what are the kind of two main sort of big themes that you think would be really helpful for everybody that's listening? Yeah, so I'm my responsibility. I'm um, on point for driving this transformation for ourselves as a company. So we've been on a Gen AI journey for the last two years, actually. Um, and you know, we fundamentally believe that our business, the services business, is going to get transformed inside out, outside in. The commercial model, the value proposition, the go-to-market, the skills, you know, pretty much everything. So. Um, you know, we're trying to do this uh, reasonably successfully, I would say, and you know, we're trying to share with with you know our customers around how we're doing this, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the stuff that I wish I would have been able to go back in time six months ago or a year ago and sort of tell tell myself. So, the two themes which are um, seem to be most interesting for the C-suite right now. And by C-suite, I mean the CIO, the CFO, the CEO, CHRO. Number one is organizational readiness. So how do people truly get ready for this? What are the skills that need to be developed? Uh, what's the mindset which needs to change? How you know, do you have to unlearn a whole bunch of skills to, to make this happen? And to give you a sense, you know, we're, uh, we've rolled out uh, a school of AI to every single one of our tens of thousands of people uh, with certain things which are mandatory for everybody. So responsible AI is something that every single employee needs to understand. Uh, the, the art and science of prompting is something that everybody needs to understand. We believe that's a fundamental skill as important as 
you know, and as natural that we take for granted today as knowing how to browse the internet or write a, you know, uh, use a, uh, uh, a word editor, but it's not natural for everybody. I had to go through a unlearning and relearning exercise on how to do efficient prompting. So, yeah, organizational readiness is, is number one. I think the second one um, is uh, responsible AI. So how do you do this at speed uh, and find the right balance between risk and reward? How do you do this in a way where you don't put unnecessary speed bumps for the organization? You take away the speed bumps, but you put the guardrails in place for the company to do the right thing and to strike this fine balance between you know, not succumbing to the hype, because there is, you know, let's be honest about it, there is a fair amount of hype in the industry, but how do you truly extract genuine value for people and for the business? And how do you help people to become the best versions of themselves? Uh, and how do you make something which, you know, actually means something to, to the business at the end of the day? So that responsible AI dimension is super, super important. And Again, we've come as far as actually, you know, we're politely but firmly declining to do work if it doesn't include a responsible AI dimension to it because it's so fundamental, it's so important, mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do, it's a competitive differentiation as well. So, yeah. So you're talking about fundamentals. I think all of us could probably agree that from a fundamentals or a foundation perspective, we can't necessarily realize all these things that we talk about from an AI without actually having the right data foundation in place as a part of that. Carlos, I know that you all have been working um, kind of with an early access uh, with Microsoft Fabric, and I was curious if you can tell a little bit about you know, the journey that you've been on and how you all have been thinking about get, making sure you've got the foundation right. Yes, uh, it's important the foundation of data because without with this foundation, we don't have AI. We can't put, can't put AI inside of a bunch of things uh, without a, a, a great foundation. And Fabric comes to, to, to fill a gap that we had in the past because we need to move our data from different layers of our architecture. We need to get the data from the system of records, pass to the uh, data hubs, and pass to the semantic layers and pa until this data arrived at the end user, in the report, in the Power BI, in the dashboards. So uh, Fabric could get could fill this gap. So it's very impressive, the, the use of the fabric in, the, in this way. And another important thing that in our company already have many things that we publish in the, our data lake. So, but this data is already in a parquet format. So we could use the shortcut of fabric <coughs> to connect this data and then get the insights and move to the other layers. So, and in this event, we are very impressive with the releases and co-pilot with Fabric and the general availability because in the past we only try as a POC, but now we can put it inside of our production systems. Are you, where are you in that journey? Have you actually seen um, sort of some of the results as you've been kind of building out that foundation and testing it? Yes, we, we could uh, connect other clouds. S3, for example, we could connect with, with Fabric and uh, a new capability that was improved by this this uh, tool, so uh, did, uh, I think it's a, a, a great achievement uh, for Microsoft to, to put this SaaS application. We don't need to, to provide any kind of infrastructure, so this is already available. We only click to the create a lake house and create a warehouse, so uh, it's very easy to, to connect those things and use as a, a, a end user perspective. And the other, and the other hand, we hand, we have different teams that can work together inside of the same tool. We don't need to move without applica with application from one side and other side. Only one application with the SaaS uh, perspective. So I think it's a, a, a great achievement of Microsoft. Perfect. Rich, I'm sort of curious. Okay. You, you know, within Accenture sort of sit at this unique, what I kind of consider <clears> this <throat> crux between, you're seeing all these things kind of happen from a data and AI perspective. But then there's this really unique kind of industry overlay that kind of happens as a part of that. And so I'm just kind of curious if you can share with everybody a little bit around just what are you seeing from those first, like, is there any industry that's doing a little bit more than others? What use cases within those industries are really shining? Sure, happy to, happy to share. So uh, I guess the first thing to say is, you know, this is 
super transformational. We all know it. We wouldn't be here if we didn't think it was a big deal. And, and what we've seen is an acceleration of that excitement. So um, I guess the first thing, you know, we looked at different studies. So we ran a couple studies recently. And uh, of course, not surprising, 97% of the C executives that we speak to believe this is going to transform their industry. So that's not surprising to anyone. 46% to your point say data is the biggest problem to moving fast. So they got to figure out how do they get the data. And 94% have budgeted next year to have a much bigger budget. Um, now over the last nine months, we've seen the number of um, clients that want to do work in this space double every quarter. We've seen the size of the deals double every quarter. So clearly, our clients are starting to get nervous and want to accelerate. And that's before they have budget, because <laughs> everybody's budget was set before all this started. So, uh, um, so the types of projects, so you know, it was early days. So I think the types of projects that, became, that came along at first, we're, we're starting to see a big pivot. So of course, we had a lot of the service and the customer service and those types of projects. Those are kind of the number one area and the number one use case. Um, in the past and the number one sets of pilots. The other one is um, sales and marketing in general, which is very similar, mm -hmm. you know, it's the other side of that coin. Um, and uh, software delivery, oddly, is the third biggest area we get lots of questions about. Um, and then the general creativity and kind of augmentation. What we're seeing now with Microsoft 365 Copilot is a lot more clients are interested in what, what Jason was talking about, which is let's start with the basics. We have some tools. Because nine months ago, there were less tools, so people were building everything custom. Yep. Uh, and nine months ago, everything was, uh, let's test the technology. So now we're seeing a big shift that, you know, the technology's there. <laughs> you know, the parts that work, work. Of course, it's going to grow, and we're going to see these different releases. So we're seeing a shift from doing individual POCs and individual technology tests to looking at an end-to-end -end use case and, and how does it impact that whole use case, whether it's uh, worker productivity or something in uh, the supply chain or in customer service. So that's the big pivot is the pivot from small POCs to looking at a whole either user group or, or an end-to-end -end process. Around industry, um, again, I think that's shifting. So every industry is, is, is being impacted, and we have work across all the industries. The biggest industries so far have been the ones that have high customer service, uh, high sales. So it's been a lot of banking, a lot of CMT, because they have huge call centers. Uh, and then uh, next would be, uh, I guess, pharma, which is interesting, pharma and uh, medical, um, and retail. Um, is the next one. And then government has been investing heavily because they have so many citizens, one small change has a big impact. But again, I'm seeing a shift in that too because now that there are products out there and platforms and you don't have to build everything, you can augment, extend. Um, we're seeing a lot more interest across every, all industries, really. So I think it's gonna be a huge year um, starting <laughs> now, you know, the gun was shot last yep. night, I guess, yep. <laughs> uh, when we see it. So I don't know if that answers. Right. No, that's great. So, Mike, I'm going to pull a little bit of a thread, and um, I'm, I'm actually going to ask a couple of you this sort of same question in a little bit of a different way. So you talked a bit about there was an announcement on Monday related to Copilot Studio. Yep. And you had not necessarily heard or knew about Copilot Studio. You had been in this plan for the things that you were doing just around you know, M365 Copilot. I think a lot of us in this room go, there's a lot of pressure in the priorities of the things we're just doing from an IT perspective. Business, in some respects, going, how do we actually start to utilize this in some way? How are you thinking about, all right, I just learned something new. We're planning this stuff. How do we then slot that in right. and do the education? Like, how are you thinking about that from, from your organization? So we're, the way we're thinking of it, and then this has totally changed in the last 48 hours. No, it's evolved. It hasn't changed. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, M365 Copilot is both foundational and transformational. Yeah. So the foundational portion of it is that it's going to make a, a large portion of our population, I would say, AI and prompt literate. Because then that will, they can build upon that for different use cases. They'll think differently about what they're going to do. So we are still going to start with that, um, with, with a uh, you know majority of the population. Because you talk about personal productivity first with M365 Copilot, but then it gets to 
workflows within an organization, and then it gets to processes across organizations. Mm -hmm. And so we want to start at that, you know, the lowest common denominator first with the personal productivity and drive that. And then I think the ingenuity engine will start to roll. That's the theory. Um, and then the capabilities are growing and maturing all at the same time. And, and we can, I think we could speed along how, that journey. How are you handling the, the people change as a part of that? Yeah, uh, very carefully. So it's, um, <laughs> um, the, you, we have to stay, we're, we're starting first with people, culture, and, and behavior. Um, and we're partnering actually with Avanad on, the, um, on our deployment plan, an adoption plan. We're calling it an adoption plan, not a deployment plan. Because you could just turn everything on on day one and see what happens. And, and then you know, go help train and, and learn and all that stuff afterwards. But we don't want our deployment to get ahead of our adoption. But at the same time, we want to get the value as fast as we can. So we're trying to thread that needle. Um, and what we've found is like the prompting expertise or the prompting acumen, I don't know if there's a term for that, but I'll just made it up maybe, um, is that some people are like born prompters somehow out of the 300 that we've had. Mm -hmm. um, some are kind of in that middle pack and they use, you know, they use prompts, but they also use the suggested prompts. And then we have uh, some laggards too, maybe 10, 15% out of the, you know, kind of the surveys that, that we've done, and we don't want to leave the middle pack or the laggards behind. The, those front folks are just going to—they're going to go. Um, and so we got to—you got to stay close to your people on it all. And it's—and we want to bring up the the foundational M365 capabilities too. I'll give a—I'll give a quick analogy. I know we're—I don't want to take too much time, but some people with Excel know how to put in numbers and and words. Some people know how to do formulas. Uh, and then other people yet can do uh, charts. And then fewer people can do pivot tables. And so, I mean, just a, you know, a quick example. And so prompting, we're seeing the same level of maturity and expertise or acumen across that. So we gotta, everybody's got to do pivot tables to get the most value out of it. So we want to get there with the personal productivity first um, and then move on to the workflows and then the end-to-end -end work processes and you know, keep, keep growing that. But I would say we gotta stay close to the people and understand their roles, their jobs, the things that they do every day and that's when we're gonna get the most value and that's where the transformational part is gonna get built off the foundational part. And then that's when I think that there will be parity between the hype and the value. Got it, okay, perfect. Florian, I see you nodding a lot. I'm gonna to come to you in a second. Uh, for any of those that are in the room, there should be QR codes somewhere. If you want, we're gonna to get to questions from all of you uh, in a moment. So if you wanna put a question in there, please scan that QR code if you're in the room. Uh, it is over there. Uh, for those of you that are online, uh, you've got the Q&A box to kind of um, put your question in there as well. So you're nodding. I know you and I have had multiple conversations about how we put people before the AI. And I'm wondering just kind of what, what's in your head of how how to actually kind of make that real. Yeah. So two dimensions on this. So I think the first one, I very much um, agree with, uh, with Mike is around training. And there are some people who are sort of born and are natural on this. Uh, to be perfectly honest, and this is going to be really embarrassing, um, I'm, I wasn't. So when I started using Copilot about a year ago or you know whatever, I was horrible at it. And I remember, I'm not a native English speaker, as you can probably hear, and I always felt bad around my emails, sort of, you know, I'm not able to express myself as eloquently in English. So I started using Copilot to write what I thought were more intelligent and useful sounding <laughs> emails. Um, and my emails started to get longer and complicated, and I was patting myself on, myself on the shoulder <laughs> saying, Thorin, you're suddenly so much more intelligent. Um, only to, to, I very quickly found out my team was using Copilot to uh, read my emails or pretend that they read my emails uh, because they were too complex, right? So. Um, I, um, okay, this is kind of embarrassing uh, for a chief AI officer, um, but true. So I, I think training and you know, uplifting the entire organization is really, really important. I think the other dimension is you know, don't get overly obsessed by technology because technology is going to change every single week. If you're looking at business priorities, they hopefully change a little bit more manageable, and the way we're thinking about it is we're asking the why, not the what. So ask yourself, the why, why are we doing this in the first place, and what's the ultimate objective we're trying to reach? 
for us, as an example, top priority is customer satisfaction. So how do we do this in a way which helps us with our customer satisfaction, which are the use cases, the processes that we can apply this to? So yeah, I mean, it's kind of, some, it's kind of obvious, but um, uplift everybody in the organization. Ask yourself the, the why um, instead of the, uh, the what. And ask yourself the how to do it ethical and with a mindset, again, I would say, I really, really believe this. It's not just productivity and efficiency and cost reduction, although obviously, you know, that's a good thing. Ask yourself, how can you do this in a way which empowers your people, which helps, you know, your people to become the best versions of themselves, to realize their full potential, to do things they weren't maybe even imagining themselves that they would be able to do. Because I think this co-pilot technology from Microsoft is able to do that. Um, to really, really, you know, e enable us and to have a more joyous, a more, you know, empowering work experience uh, and life experience for that matter as well. So, yeah. Perfect. I know I sound like a hippie now, but uh, <laughs> it, it is really important. If you do that, the business benefits come as well. <clears throat> yep. um, Carlos, I'm going to, same similar question, but I'm going to do it a little bit of a different way. So you're all looking at what you're doing with Fabric and the data foundation that you're kind of building there, Fabric changes the business model in some respects, right? So what Microsoft has done in the simple way that I think about it is we used to have data and the compute and the way you processed it, they always needed to be in the same place. And what Fabric allows us to be able to do is go data is here and then I can process that somewhere else. There's a fundamental change in the way you think about the architecture and the approach that you need to take. And so how are you kind of working through that in your early days here of trying to understand in certain use cases or different parts of your business how you're actually applying it and maybe that's letting you think differently yeah. about how you actually architect and deliver the value as a part of it. Yeah, uh, it's important. Uh, and uh, the use case that we, we, we tried Fabric was about health and safety. We have different system, different spreadsheets, different words, uh, and we need to get this data and put on, the, uh, on an easy way to our customers uh, client, uh, use these 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 insights. So uh, we get this kind of data, put in our repositories, uh, and then put a generative AI in, on top of it. So in the first first wave, uh, we only answer some easy questions about uh, I need to to take a maintenance maintenance. I need to use a glove or not. The, the generative AI could answer these questions. Uh, and the people before needed to read a very big uh, PDF or something like that. So it's, it's, it's speed up our, our uh, delivers from, the, from our, our customers. And then it's, uh, it's very valuable for our company. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Rich, I'm kind of curious. I want to go back to. Um, sort of responsible AI in some way. So <clears throat> I think of responsible AI is extremely important. It is foundational. I also think it's really, really hard, mm -hmm. right? Because in some respects, there is things that actually come native from Microsoft and the platform, but then there's other business processes and things you've got to do sort of around that to support it. Um, and I'm kind of curious, sort of, how's Accenture thinking about that and kind of bringing it to life kind of with clients? Sure, and, uh, and I agree, it's super important, <laughs> as, as you said, too. Um, so yeah, our view is, I mean, responsible AI is foundational um, and, and kind of stage zero, base zero. And I am proud of what Microsoft's doing because I think it's a great start. And if you look at all the stuff, it's a, it's a great foundation to get started. But, for us, I mean, responsible AI, and, and this isn't going to be a shock to, to most people, it's foundational and it's around you know, ethics, no harm, no bias is kind of the first level of it. It's around uh, regulatory, legality, and compliance is kind of the second one, making sure you hit those two. And the third one is, uh, is really around explainability. When you have uh, AI, can you explain it? It's around keeping things secure uh, uh, for individuals. Uh, it's around the workforce, so we also look at the impact on the workforce um, because it does change the workforce. Um, and more and more, everything we do is, is also has to be sustainable. So we look at a full wide breadth of what does it mean to have responsible AI. 
because <clears throat> what you can do, you maybe shouldn't do. <laughs> you know, so we try to take a broad look, and, and our approach tries to look across all of that and, uh, and put it in as a foundational component. And then it's a question of, you know, how do you get started? Um, and there's various ways, and we have different approaches around looking at your, op your readiness and doing assessments, but then how do you set up teams? Um, because if you don't have an owner and a team and somebody owning it, it's not something that's a policy that sits on a shelf. It needs to be managed effectively. Um, so everything from governments to ownerships to how do you implement it. So we kind of try to look at the, at the whole piece. I don't know if that no, that's helps. Great. I don't know, Florin, I mean, you do a lot of that as well. Anything to add to my well, I, thoughts? I think you're, you're, you're spot on, Rich. I mean, maybe the only thing I would add is that I've seen some organizations which are really, really good at this to try to apply their company's values and principles on top of responsible AI and basically look to encapsulate and encode the best version of their company culture. Because, you know, if we're being honest with ourselves, I mean, every sort of, you know, executive likes to talk about values and principles and, you know, sometimes they're on the dot com. Uh, Sometimes they're on a PowerPoint somewhere, which sort of people, nobody reads. Um, and if you're a good organization, that's culture is what people do and you know, management is not around. But what I think we have an opportunity and what I see the best in class do is to truly incorporate these values and principles into the solution so they become part of everyday fabric of the solutions you build. So for example, for us, um, you know, one of our core values is to empower every voice in the company. And, you know, there is a very strong reason why, um, why we're, we're doing it and the way we're deploying M365 is actually to empower every single employee in the company to become the best versions of themselves and to have their voice heard. So we've seen, as an example, tremendous re uh, success with neurodiverse part of our population, people who maybe have dyslexia or lack you know, sort of the confidence to get started. Copilot, M365 Copilot has made a huge, huge difference to those people. And, you know, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, incorporate, add, try to add your company's values and norms and what you truly, truly believe uh, into the responsible AI framework, not just the necessary sort of, you know, minimum baseline of keeping you out of trouble. That's the, to, to build on that with a real example, um, or from Dow, um, we have four, of course we have our, our values around integrity and respect for people, but our four cultural attributes that we want every colleague to carry are trust, transparency, empowerment, and accountability. And so if you think about those four and what you said and teaching that to the, to the models, I mean, if you stick to those, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Great. So, yeah. Perfect, I wanna make sure we get to some of the audience questions. Um, so just give us a minute so I can, they get queued up here so I can see them. Hopefully they're difficult and put us on the spot a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this to whoever kind of wants to answer it first. There is so much talk about AI sort of everywhere at the moment. Are we in a hype cycle? Absolutely. I mean, we're in a hype cycle, but it's about it, does, the, does the value and what we can actually produce, the capabilities we can produce from it match that hype cycle. Because the, um, you know, when we all think about hype cycles the last several years, there's been some things that go through and they get the high hype. And then you, know, you have that, what is it, the trough of despair or something mm -hmm. like that, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't see a trough on, on this one personally. Maybe I'm, I'm optimistic, naturally speaking. Um, and and you know, Microsoft didn't make me say any of this, but I, I, I think that there's parity with the hype with the value that we're gonna get out of it at the end of the day. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, I would say I think we're in a huge hype cycle, which the problem with that is the noise it creates because yes. there's so much. I heard the yes. expression earlier, AI and Gen AI washing, I think was the word which I, I loved. Because <laughs> everybody says they have it, everybody says they do it, and I think that will actually distract from the real value. Agreed. <laughs> yep. Because people are gonna be off hunting and listening to every snake salesman, yeah. <laughs> snake yep. girl salesman that's out there. Yeah. I do get more spam now <laughs> yeah. than I used to. Just one perspective I would, I would add is, you know, I think we have a responsibility as an industry, and I hope you, know, you in this room agree, to try to manage that you know, risk of overhyping, because we, I, I don't think we want to wait 
you know, five years or 10 years for people to realize that this can actually solve, help solve some of humanity's biggest challenges. I mean, this can help with education, with, with healthcare, with equality, with climate change, with financial equality. I mean, it's, it's happening right now. We, I mean, there are examples of new drugs being found, uh, cars being created, you know, in a year and a half rather than five years, new metals being created, uh, new drugs discovered. This is real. I mean, it, it really, really changes um, every, you know, every industry and it has the power for so much good. So I think, it, you know, we just need to be careful we're not falling in the trap of, you know, over overhyping and finding the easy way out and, you know, risking a long drawn out period where people, where people are cynical about this because, you know, uh, we rushed into the wrong thing too quickly. Yeah, perfect. All right, we've got a question from Sean. Um, Mike, I think we maybe start this one with you. So in our industry, financial services, we look at opportunities for AI co-pilots in use specific areas to move it faster, like efficiency or workflow process, or to take time back. Um, with that in mind, are there any sort of examples of kind of where you're at of just deployments in these? I think the way I look at this is there's the custom co-pilot side yep. versus the actual co-pilot kind of out of the box from Microsoft. Thanks. Yeah, we're, we're definitely looking at this. I mean, the, the first three personas we're going after are the, the IT support. So every employee in the company needs IT support, right? Um, HR support, every in person in the company needs HR support at some point in time. People leaders or managers need it even more at times. Um, and then we're gonna move on from there, but we're doing some things with research scientists. Um, we're doing some things with customer service reps. And so instead of having you know three different systems of record and a, like you mentioned the PDF from EHS, right? All up on their three different screens, how do you just give them one interface to do those things? Not have to remember the transactions they have to run, but is this order gonna be on time or not? Or do I have any issues going on with this customer with you know, credit? Um, and just being able to ask that in natural language instead of going to the operating discipline, looking at the transaction, going to their system of record, typing it in and then figuring it out, but just let's, let's just put it where they're at. Yeah, no, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, I'll give an example. So um, we're helping um, uh, a bank in Latin America uh, who is receiving 100,000 letters every month mm -hmm. to change the way they're, they're dealing with that. So this is everything from customer letters of complaint to customer who are saying you're awesome to letters from partners, from suppliers, uh, co formal correspondence with the financial ombuds ombudsman, uh, case resolution, and a lot of those letters are you know kind of the same uh, they they have a pretty standard response some of them are very complicated and and they re require intelligence and experience so the bank is using um, uh, a gen ai co-pilot which is trained with their insights their know-how it's reasoning on top of tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of um, uh, documents they have in SharePoint and OneDrive combines that with line of business systems to understand the nature and the type of the correspondence to synthesize that and create the first draft of the response back to um, to the, uh, the, the the person or the people or the body who created it, and that's that's real heavyweight optimization and actually making the life of those people who are otherwise have to write the, those letters from scratch a lot more delightful as well. This is real. Perfect. Um, this next one's uh, from Matt. Uh, maybe Rich, we start this one with you. It's about educating the C-suite about the potential of AI. So how can they get behind championing or investing time towards it, um, mm -hmm. specifically if the C-suite wants to avoid it because it maybe is in a hype cycle? So I would say, um, so our CEO, Julie Sweet, was on, um, was on one of the live streams yesterday with Jared. Um, so Accenture has been piloting M365 Copilot uh, for quite a while now, and we're rolling it out to 200,000, a little more than 200,000 employees. And, and she kind of answered that question. So I'll give her answer, because then I won't get fired. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she, she said, uh, she said the, the way that we're doing it and the way that we would recommend doing it is we actually rolled M365 Copilot out first to our most senior people and we trained them on it. <laughs> and we didn't roll out the product, we, we rolled it out and had sessions to help them understand how to do prompt engineering and all that kind of stuff. 
because without doing it, you can't understand it. You can read about it and, oh, it's that new fangle thing, but when you actually do it and you feel the magic, that's how you get empowered and excited, and then you'll be the champion helping others um, to roll it out. So we did leaders and, and then down in, in different uh, uh, cohorts and segments uh, as the rollout, and we're just planning the, the full rollout, but it will clearly be done the same way. Um, and it's quite effective. So she gave her personal example is, you know, you know she probably wasn't the first person to, to, uh, to, to try it when she got it, to be honest, but, but then when she actually sat down and used it, she's like, oh my gosh. And then she gave the example of how she's been having this back and forth in email and it's been this big debate and she asked, you know, asked uh, M365, what's the answer? Because all I get is this email and, and it gave it to her and she's like, okay, I'm sold. You know, I don't have to read as much. So I would say um, nothing convinces people more than doing it themselves and practicing. So, you know, get them engaged, uh, educate them, get them engaged, and there'll be um, more champions. Yeah. So, um, Carlos, I want to do this one to you. This is from Adrian. Um, as you think about all these new applications or features that are being rolled out, how do you think about the competitive advantage of the things you have to do? Because you may be actually building or trying to implement something today, and then in three months from now, it's completely changed of what you could actually do. How, yeah, how, do, you, how do you think about that? Great question, by the way, Adrian. I have to say that's the, uh, the trillion dollar question. Um, well, the, yeah, sorry. Oh, he's not building it up too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, uh, trillion a dollars are here. A great question. You need to, 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 to create the right balance with the, 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 these things. Uh, in our company, we try to, to test and figure it out in the, in the advance, and then we try to, to go forward with our partners, uh, Avanade, Microsoft, and so on, and try to implement a real use case to address this kind of thing. So uh, some, uh, in, we have internal questions, questionnaires that we pass different areas and then try to prioritize what they really need. Because if we, we use these uh, things, uh, we, we, uh, we find an area that don't really need a hit, they will be the commissioned and then they, we, we will put our efforts uh, uh, without any kind of, of return of the company. So I think that we need to, to create the right balance. Perfect. All right. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. I want to do a rapid fire for all of you. Uh, super <coughs> quick on your answer. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your peer that maybe is in the audience or, or just listening? Uh, we'll go down the line to the floor, and I'm going to start with you. Uh, I'll actually build upon um, the question uh, which was asked previously from Adrian. So I think for those of you who are technologists, get really, really sharp on where you want to consume ready-made AI, mm -hmm. where you want to customize AI, and if you want to create your own AI. Because they have very difficult uh, and different uh, value equations. Um, and getting really clear on consume, customize, create is, is really, really critical. So you don't waste money on stuff which is going to become obsolete or standardized a, f a, few, a few months later. Um, Perfect. Rich? Yeah, I would say that um, you know, Gen AI, the hype, um, which is also real, is building on AI, which was part of your pitch in the beginning. I'd say start now. <laughs> because uh, it was a famous quote from uh, a professor that we work with at, at Harvard Business Review that says, you know, the fast followers in this generation are never going to catch up <laughs> because it is moving so fast that you'll never catch up. So I would say start now. There's enough stuff out there. You start with the products and you build on them. You figure out where you're going to extend and customize. But if you want to wait and see and test and pilot, then you're going to be way behind the next guy who you're competing with. Perfect. Mike? So I'll do this really quickly. I know we only have a few minutes, but I got to call out. <laughs> Cyrus put my name in the question, so thank you for making me feel special, and I will answer that <laughs> in concert with the other question <laughs> uh, itself. I uh, appreciate that. Um, and you mentioned the word calculus, uh, and uh, God bless you. Um, but if you, if you think about you know, the, the, uh, how you used to learn math, and, and going from addition to, to multiplication to algebra to trig to calculus, um, the, the build your own, or the, the uh, what's there already out of the box, it's almost like you're already at trig. 
And if you want to do a calculus, you know, go ahead and customize and, and, and build your own, but you might not have to. Um, and just because we're close to Canada, I'll use a hockey analogy. We used to say, um, you know, skate to the puck, not, not from where it's being hit from, but where it's, where it's going. And it's almost like with some of the things we've heard the last 48 hours, the puck's going out of the rink. So just think wide, think broad, think innovatively, um, and, uh, and go for it that way. Carlos? Uh, from my side, uh, I would like to, to share with you the importance of share the AI with the company. AI is not from technology. AI is from the company. Yeah. So we need to address things that the company needs, not from the AI team. So that's my, my final thought. Perfect. Well, I want to thank all of you for taking the time and sharing your thoughts. Um, there are some other sessions that we have that are going on today. There will be a fabric one, and there's an on-demand around responsible AI for anybody that wants to watch and listen. And uh, if you come up upstairs to room 429, we are more than happy to share more of the stories of the things that we are working on. So wherever you are in your day, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.